Well, Emma, thank you very much for that great presentation. It was it was interesting um, hearing about the broader impacts of, of this, or with not only within the South Central region, but across the country and some other. So we do have some questions in the chat. And uh, for those of you that have joined us, please go ahead and put your questions in the Q&A. But um, this is from Dr. Bach. Let me read his. Does the spread of disease pathogens occur only because of their of their human host or their host domains expand with climate change? Or does the change in climate also directly affect the virulence and prevalence of the microorganisms? Yes. Um, the, well, the answer to that is, is the latter is true. So um, both occurs. So the spread of disease um, and these pathogens occur because their hosts move and also their vectors move. So things like mosquitoes um, and also reservoirs, especially when you think about migratory species and species that have a very broad distribution. Uh, so that occurs, yes. And then also changing climate directly affects the virulence, especially of uh, bacteria species and viral species that prefer or are, um, uh, or, or yeah, I guess prefer specific climates. So I'm thinking of maybe more humid climates in relation to more arid climates. Um, uh, so yes, the answer is both. Both of those are going to affect the spread of zoonoses into different habitats. Okay, very good. Thanks so much. So our next question is, um, from your experience of what's been published in the literature, are different groups of mammals more likely to cause problems than others in terms of this question? Yes. Um, so I what I've seen is that especially organisms that um, come in closer contact with humans. So of course the peri-domestic species, uh, things like raccoons and, and badgers and um, you know coyotes, pigs, things like that, or not pigs, but, um, and then you also have the close association with agricultural species. So wild sheep coming into close contact with domesticated sheep. Um, and then, just species that have, you know, that come in close, um, in close proximity with areas that have a higher concentration of, of humans. Right. Uh, I think that also any animal species that are really prevalent in sort of those global hotspots that we talked about, um, animals that are generalists and can live in different areas uh, versus specialists that stay in one particular area or occupy one specific niche. Um, I think that those individuals, and, and I'm not sure, you know, if carnivores versus rodents versus bats, I know that a lot of rodents and a lot of bats and a lot of carnivores uh, do uh, exhibit kind of a high prevalence of zoonoses, but I, I'm not quite sure as far as one particular group of, of animals. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's going to be the follow-up to, 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 to the question because, you know, from my experience as a microbiologist and it, it, it seems that rodents are most likely to be, because they're small, we don't pay attention to them. And I'm thinking of hantavirus, for example, as being one of those breakout kinds of, of situations. So, you know, from, from your experience, I mean, a lot of people work, uh, track small mammals, particularly the rodents around the world. Is that something that's, is that, is that some aspect of, of this problem that more people are interested in? You yes. know, than, than, than say, raccoons or possums? Right, right. I think that um, it, it, sometimes it's easier to, to look at more of the sentinel species, which would be something like a raccoon or an opossum or, or coyote, something like that. But I think that it is important, not just because I work for Dr. Bradley, uh, <laughs> I think it is very important to, to research the small mammals, um, the small rodent or the rodents in general, because they play a lot of, of ecological roles as far as, you know, coming into contact with a lot of different individual or species in the environment. They, of course, are, are prey species for a lot of the, the other, uh, uh, for a lot of the other species in the ecosystem. Uh, for instance, deer mice, you would not ever think that they uh, would carry a lot of, of diseases, but they do. And they also come into contact with deer, right? Hence uh -huh. the name. And so that's an association that people don't think about 
that so two completely different species like that would come together um, and, you know, maybe transfer something like uh, we're working on a project on chronic wasting disease. And I didn't mention that in this for time's sake, but uh, we're seeing that there is a transmission potentially of chronic wasting disease between deer, a deer mouse and a deer. So I think that, yes, the answer is that uh, we need to definitely look at uh, and research small mammals as a primary reservoir and vector of zoonoses. Okay, very good, thank you much. So our next question is, um, is there any way to measure the effect of specific extreme weather events like the February 2021 polar vortex on pathogen populations or is it, or is that level of specificity too granular uh, no, to show up in research? No, I think that it is possible and that is one of the main reasons why we are looking at one particular location. Um, so junction, the junction camp, uh, campus for Texas Tech, it, it, you know, is in the hill country. We are able to have a a species that we have collected, or Dr. Bradley's collected over 25 years. We are going to look at the prevalence of certain zoonoses before that particular event and then after and see if there is maybe a change in pathogen population, like a quantification of it, but we're also going to change going to look at the composition. So is there maybe a pathogen that did that could not withstand the the freeze? Um, and uh, maybe there was another pathogen that, that kind of took its place, sort of mm. a pathogen competition type of situation. Um, and then you also have that, the extreme freezes uh, allows, for, um, allows for the fluctuation of certain uh, pathogens in, in, to, to move maybe from one host to the next. Uh, so we're definitely going to look at uh, extreme weather events and we're going to start with this pilot study, and then we're going to look at maybe other extreme weather events throughout the United States. Right. Yeah, I, I know when I was when I was a postdoc a long time ago in Las Cruces, we did a bunch of work on wood rats and the, the importance of wood rats to the functioning of desert systems. But one of the things that would periodically happen is you'd have bubonic plague moving through the landscape, and all the wood rats would die. And then the system, the ecological system, the landscape would all change for about three to five years because there were not enough wood rats to carry out the function they normally would, and the system would have to restart if it ever did. Mm -hmm. So instead of wood rats being the primary prey item of whatever species, they would have to shift to the next one, right. the, you know, the next one. So, th so there's multiple facets of, of wildlife health and how climate impacts those species. And, and so that's why we're trying to kind of start these pilot projects because there's so many different layers to the story so that if we can, if we can be a little bit more specific and look at this specific system, then maybe it can be a model for, you know, maybe that system where certain prey species are wiped out and, and that sort of a thing. Very good. No, fair, thanks. So we have a couple questions in the Q&A. So let me go ahead and read the, and read, start with the first one. And that is, how do wildlife animals spread these diseases to humans? Is it through consumption of the animal meat or through other means? And how can we remain cautious when interacting with wildlife that could carry disease? I think that the um, how diseases are spread is less likely to be through consumption. I think that more often times what happens is with direct contact with their bodily fluids or with something that they have touched or been around. Um, for instance, with certain rodent species, you may not realize, but certain areas, you know, of your home, you know, or, or maybe not your home, but like a, you know, some building that you come into contact with, things like that, that you don't necessarily think, um, and especially with things like hantavirus, you don't think about their urine, their feces can carry that and you pick it up and you don't necessarily realize it, you know, in, in the air. Um, so I think, I know that that is more oftentimes how humans are infected with that particular pathogen. It's not necessarily because of ingestion of, of their, of them. 
Um, and then how can we remain cautious when interacting with wildlife that carry diseases? I think the most important thing is to be aware of what species carries what uh, zoonoses. Um, even kind of going through the literature, I learned that just in Texas, there were, you know, that list of zoonoses that you would never think um, existed. And there is an increase in certain years and there's a decrease in certain years. So you start to think, why is that? And maybe there's some sort of, you know, environmental fluctuation. But I think the best thing that we can do is be aware that um, certain bats can carry rabies and certain rodents can carry hantaviruses. I think that's the most important thing. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, very good, thanks much. Okay, so here's our next question. Our next question is, can you talk about specifically a possum's ability to carry disease? And I've read conflicting information about their ability to carry infectious diseases due to their body temperature. That is a great question. I've heard conflicting information as well about whether or not opossums carry a high zoonotic load. Um, a lot of people tend to think that opossums are, um, for lack of a better word, nasty creatures and they're dirty and they, and they carry all of these zoonoses. But I've also read that they, that in fact, other species like raccoons and coyotes are a little bit, um, you know, they have, they carry more, a higher zoonotic load. I have no idea about uh, a possum's body temperature and how that affects their ability to carry infectious diseases. If I were to think about that for a second, I think that any <laughs> animal species that typically has a higher body temperature would not be able to have as high of a zoonotic load just because temperature is one of the key ways that we fight off infections. Uh, specifically of, you know, things like bacteria and viruses. So, and that's why we have fevers and our body does that um, quite well. So I'm not quite sure the answer to that question. Okay, no, but thanks. Okay, here's our next one. In, from, your, from your perspective, are there, I mean, you've mentioned um, bats and some small rodents. Um, for Texas in general, what sentinel mammals would likely be the most obvious sources of, of, of zoonotic infections. And how have that, how is, how is their distribution or has it changed much over the last 50 years in Texas, for example? So I think that if, if I were to first set some of the domestic and peri-domestic species apart, I think that they carry um, so, you know, domestic and paradomestic species carry so many zoonoses that that it kind of overwhelms the, the picture. Mm. But if you were to move those uh, aside, I think that especially some, like we talked about some of the small mammals, uh, rodents, uh, some of the small carnivores, I think that if I had to guess, they would be the most prevalent as far as, as being, being sentinel and telling us about the zoonotic load of that particular region. Um, I know that there are many, many um, rodents and, and bat species that have shifted their distribution over the last 50 or so years, especially as it relates to the, the species that are more specialized. They are specific to certain regions or, or elevation. They pre prefer this habitat over this habitat. Um, so those are going to be the host species that are highly affected, I think, by climate change, because if their particular habitat is affected, they may not be able to find another habitat that they that they prefer, that they need. Uh, now, generalists, on the other hand, um, I'm not too sure. Uh, generalists are general in that they pref they don't prefer any habitat and they can exploit kind of any niche and be successful at it. So I think that, um, so yeah, I think that uh, small mammals, especially rodents, and then um, some of the bats that are really common, I think those are the, the uh, those are the host species that we need to watch out for and that uh, ha has changed distribution in the Most, past. Okay, interesting. Yeah, because one of the other questions that came up um, is what exotic species are you aware of that are, that are moving through Texas 
that you know that have played a role in some of this um oh my goodness um so i i know of some ungulate species of <laughs> of exotics that have played a part in some of this um and then of course you know migratory species that come in contact with those uh exotic species sure. uh, we're, uh, just that uh, chronic wasting project where we're looking at axis axis come into contact with mule deer and white-tailed deer in addition to other species so um, that's a great thought that you also have exotic species that are in on the landscape that are interacting now whether or not they transmit or play a part in the transmission of the zoonosis i think maybe doesn't even matter because they're coming you know maybe they're coming into close contact and 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 um and spreading it. Uh, so yeah, that's a that's a great point. Exotics. So one of the things somebody brought up. Um, so one of the one of the animals that somebody mentioned is nutrias, and whether nutrias coming into the Gulf Coast are part of this problem of migration of subtropical things northward. Yes, yes. I'm glad you said that. That is um, on our list of uh, as far as uh, surveillance in the junction area. We have that um, in addition to the other animal species that would exploit that same sort of semi-aquatic niche. Uh, nutrias are becoming a very big problem, similar to feral hogs. Uh, not, not necessarily exotic, but they, they have sort of that same role of being kind of a negative impact of a an exotic force, you know, in, in the ecosystem. So mm -hmm. they are definitely out competing the host species. Um, and if they are, um, if they have a high zoonotic load, then what does that mean? They will uh, definitely be successful in the uh, transmission of that zoonosis, maybe to the, the native host that can't, uh, that's already not doing well in that specific habitat. So that, that's a, a really good comment. Oh, good, oh, good. So our next question is an interesting one. I'm interested to hear what you have to say. What has been your favorite experience or trip when doing research with this group so far? Uh, my favorite experience. Or trip. Or trip. Oh my goodness, that's putting me on the spot for sure. <laughs> um, I have so many trips that I've absolutely loved um, with Dr. Bradley and I, I enjoy field biology a lot because you get to see, you know, what a new tree looks like. And I, I remember exactly whenever we were able to collect a muskrat. And, and so you just, you learn sort of the organismal biology behind all of it. And it makes it to where you, you start to try to truly understand that organism and what it's, you know, you, you start to really get um, specific with what you want to know about these organisms. Um, my so I love the, the field biology trip part of it. Um, I also like this experience of, of putting together multiple different fields of biology and to be able to put it together into something that has a, you know, an applied, a, a very prevalent application to it. I enjoy working on projects that sort of have a basic science question, but I, I, I more so enjoy being able to put multiple basic science questions together and apply it to what's happening right now in the world. And so that's been my favorite experience thus far to have a to have a project that has multiple levels of complexity and that can can help us as, you know, as a population of humans be be able to better figure out how to you know, how to just live a better life. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, I, no, that's, no, that's very, very appropriate. Yeah, because I think part of, part of the challenge for all of us, and, and indeed from the climate centers, not only at Texas Tech, but around the country, um, is how do you make this science actionable? How do you use it to help solve problems? And obviously diseases, as we know with COVID and the transmission from bats, you know, I mean, this isn't, this is something that's going to keep occurring. And, you know, I mean, I've, you know, I've, I'm old enough now that I've lived through, what, five pandemics in my lifetime so far. You know, polio was the first. I'm old enough to have dealt with polio pandemic in the U.S. at that time. So, you know, this I see this kind of information is really being relevant to help solve these kinds of problems because we don't we don't approach it from 
from this collective ecological perspective. Right, right. And getting eco <laughs> ecologists and evolutionary biologists together is very important. <laughs> yeah, um, plus yeah. all the medical profession because we tend to silo everything up so much. Yes, getting the human health aspect into it as well. I agree with that. Yeah, um, yeah. I also want to add that um, something that has become very, um, very prevalent in what I've learned in the literature is um, that, you know, we said with, with SARS-CoV-2 that the primary um, host or vector or whatever was bats. And, and so they, you know, as a population, we immediately looked at all of this, you know, bat, all of the bat information. Uh, but now people have been looking at other species that have come in contact with bats and they found that there are plenty of um, different reservoirs and hosts or vectors, sorry, of COVID, uh, SARS-CoV-2. So including things like um, deer mice and of course the <laughs> pangolins. And so I think that that is probably the most important part that I don't want to I want to make sure that we get the whole picture and that we don't miss a key a key part in some of these transmission events. Yeah, very good. Okay, so we have another question on the uh, chat. The map that you showed um, shows invasive species or pathogens moving south from Mexico um, up to the U.S., which can amplify anti-immigrant rhetoric. Do you the arrows always go the other way? or are there movement from North America to South America? Yes, so um, I wish I had the slide, but I don't. Um, our project on chronic wasting disease, it is um, a wasting prion um, disease in cervids. And we've actually seen that the, the movement of elk species, as well as some species of deer, uh, they have been moving southward uh, specifically in areas of, I think of Colorado and um, in the Pacific Northwest, there have been certain uh, movements of those species southward um, into, and, and whether, or not, whether or not that's because of um, how extreme the winters are, or um, you know, maybe they're not finding the resources that they need then, or, or you know, we're, we're still, people are still trying to figure out that answer, but we are seeing certain uh, diseases, not necessarily zoonoses. I don't think CWD, I know CWD has not entered the human population yet, but that's one instance where I, I know that it does happen in the opposite direction. Uh, mm. But a lot of these zoonoses are, are the, the higher incidence rate is coming from the, the region of the tropics and subtropics where it's too hot, where it's too human, humid, and they are moving northward in addition to uh, human population changes. So I think it's more of a dynamic system. I, I, I think that it's just that we've seen these specific diseases be moving, you know, northward. Right. But again, that's, I don't think that's the whole part of the story. It's just the trend that we're seeing right now. Yeah, because obviously as climate shifts or has shifted previously over the last 50,000 years, like I said, those, those movements are going to be dynamic depending upon what the climate's doing, what the right. optimum habitats are. Right, and it, it could be just that we're seeing right now a snapshot of time where they're moving northward, but maybe we, we just haven't been able to document the shift in reverse, you know, that's mm -hmm. happened at another time, you know, yeah. an evolutionary time. Yeah, very good. That's a good question. Well, here's our next question, and, and it's an interesting one. Because of the high urban uh, component in Central and East Texas, are they more likely to see these kinds of interactions before we will in Lubbock? Uh, if I had to guess, I would say yes. Uh, I would say that um, the, I mean, it has to do with obviously urbanization and the high, high population size of, of that particular group. Um, I think that they would probably see a, a, a larger uh, incidence of some of these zoonoses um rather than lubbock i know lubbock is a lot drier but but again you have certain zoonoses that prefer different habitat types and different temperatures precipitation there's all these ecological variables um, that affect the survivability and transmission rate of mm -hmm. a zoonosis so i would say yes but I, i'm not quite sure what exactly um what pathogens you're going to see 
in different parts of Texas. So that's why we're looking at all of the different eco regions of Texas. We want to not just say these are the Texan zoonoses. We're trying to look at and distinguish each of them. Even the Trans-Pecos, you have sort of the, the dry Trans-Pecos area, um, and then you have more of a wet Trans-Pecos area. Yeah, so right. we're trying to look at the different uh, yeah. regions. Okay. Yeah, yeah. because I you know because it is curious as you look at what the I-35 corridor lo looks like and how it's changed over, over the years and some of the distributions of small mammals and their migration and movement around around the state you know that's that's been an interesting aspect of all this right and then you have in addition we, i mean i mentioned migratory birds but waterfowl mm, uh, yes cool. we're doing a um we submitted an nsf grant recently where we're looking at targeted um animal species that are are known to be to have a broad distribution and that um, and ones that migrate. So we're looking at waterfall in addition to deer and feral hogs um, to target their exact or not exact, but their zoonotic composition in certain areas. So yes. Good. So our next question on the chat is from Dr. George and his question is, is there a general correlation between rise in climatic temperature and receptivity to zoonoses. And receptivity to zoonoses. So the ability to be to be transmitted or for the transmission to occur. Uh, yes. Um, so increase in temperature. I well, I would say I, I would say yes. Um, I know, especially for some of the flu or, or viral infections, I know that there has been shown to be a higher correlation or a correlation between a higher temperature and for a, spe a species to become infected with a certain pathogen. And then going a step further, having the infection be from one species to another. Um, I'm not sure about animal species transmitting the that pathogen to the human population and that is something that i i hope that we are able to determine in this project uh, but i think that generally a higher temperature and a higher humidity level is correlated with a higher receptivity rate yes okay good uh, emma you mentioned something um in part of this discussion that i think um we should go back to to talk about because normally we don't consider birds as part of this overall process. You know, we, you know, I'm mean, even in my questioning and the, the chat and uh, Q and A, people were talking about mammals. Um, but I, it just dawned on me from what you were saying that is part of this climatic aspect and shift uh, and in and, and greater instance, because a lot of the diseases we come in contact with, while they used to be bacterial and they still are, mm -hmm. now they're more viral, yes. right? And so the question is, where do you, how do, you know, what is the, what is the consensus or dis, or discussion about the importance of birds versus say small mammals in a lot more of these kinds of processes? Um, I know that birds carry many uh, zoonotic agents, um, especially, you know, of course, the avian influenza uh, strain that was considered, I believe, an epidemic, if not pandemic. Um, and so, um, I know that birds play a, an essential role in the ecosystem as far as disease, you know, the disease transmission uh, between different species. I know, especially with migratory birds uh, that may carry a pathogen from one area to another um, and maybe infect a brand, you know, a brand new population of that species or maybe of another species. Um, but we often think about, or we don't think about uh, birds as a, as a species group uh, mm -hmm. themselves. And so there are many species of birds that may transmit uh, certain pathogens amongst themselves. And then that increases the likelihood of that, zo uh, that pathogen being transmitted to us. But, uh, but you're right. I mean, things like, you know, a avian influenza, Newcastle disease, I mean, there's so many different um, 
especially viral zoonoses that are transmitted um, from different bird species. Um, and then you have just, if you think about how many chickens are, and this is completely domesticated, but if you think about all of the um, domestic uh, poultry and things like that, they come into contact with maybe another uh, wildlife bird species and then, um, and then that, and then it's, you know, whatever is transmitted to us. So you also have that transmission pathway as well because of domestication. So um, I think birds definitely play a part. I'm not sure what part they play, but I, I know that they are, we should not um, keep them out of the discussion. Okay, good, thanks. Mm -hmm. One of the other questions that, that, is, that has been proposed uh, is that given the extreme climate variability within the Southern High Plains, from East Texas to New Mexico, and then uh, even North South, um, is Texas one of the is this area one of the hot spots for for zoonotic diseases across the North America? I think that it, if it is not right now, I think it should be, uh, and that it goes back to the unique ability for us to to survey. I think it's. 10, eight, eight eco regions mm -hmm. that are completely different. Um, at some, some are a little bit uh, more similar than others, but I mean that you have so many different um, eco regions that you can look at that have completely different characteristics um, versus you know others. So, yeah. for instance, in the Panhandle versus you know where I grew up in Houston on the coast, uh, you have sort of the East Texas region, you have the Hill Country. The different, you know, Trans Pecos. You've just got a very diverse um, set of habitats that you can target. So I think that if you're looking in that frame of reference, I think it is a global hot or a hot spot. I think that, um, and we'll be able to definitely determine where those hot spots are. Uh, within Texas based on being able to survey the whole region. Um, yeah, so I think that Texas is a unique opportunity for us to look at um, the, you know, this broad survey of zoonoses in the area. And then any regions in the rest of, you know, maybe the, air, the region of the United States or, or in other areas, we can use Texas maybe as a model uh, for those eco regions that match up with the ones, you know, in Texas. Okay, good. Well, we have time for a few more questions. And one of the things that was raised is, um, I believe in, when you were doing your presentation in terms of um, long data sets, you had Junction as your, as your um, example in terms of the work that Dr. Bradley did. Um, I guess the, 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 the question, if I'm, I'm sort of paraphrasing the, the question from, from the person, um, how unique or how generalized would, is, is the junction data set compared to the rest of Texas? How, how generalized? In, a, in other words, is junction, a, is junction a good example of what could happen across Texas? Or is there something unique about um, junction as a, as a model for understanding this process? I, I think that most of the species that we have that we are going to serve or we are serving, I think that a majority of them are found in other regions of the state. Okay. Um, but but I do think that in particular there in that eco region in the hill country, I think that we will find maybe a completely different zoonotic composition than in other than a, that same species, but maybe in um, I don't know a neighboring eco region. Uh, now, the other thing is that some of those species are, their distribution is maybe in particular just that location. And so we won't find it in other areas of Texas. So I think the answer is both, that it will be a good model for, for Texas, but it will also, um, for some of the species that are broadly distributed, but some of the, the species that are not broadly distributed and have, um, and may not be found, you know, in Dallas or in Houston, um, I think that in that situation, we'll need to look at the species that exploits 
that same ecological niche, we'll need to find, you know, use that and survey that species in that other region. Okay, yeah, very good. So folks, I think we have time for one or two more questions. And let me take a look to see if anything's in there. Okay, here's one of the questions. We've been talking about um, the zoonotic impacts on human health. Are there examples in Texas where diseases have, have really decimated natural populations? Um, yes, there, I mean, and the first thing that I think about is um, some of, maybe not the mammal species, but uh, some of the amphibian species, uh, especially any species that is uh, tight, tightly correlated or, or in association with any sort of water source. Um, some of the semi-aquatic and aquatic mammals are being affected because uh, simply of, of not as many resources, a uh, drying up of, of their water resources. Um, there are certain um, there are certain species that have become completely extirpated or locally um, extinct because of uh, climate change. In particular, some of the extreme fluctuations, uh, such as extreme droughts. Uh, in some instances, we go and collect um, specimens, and we, you know, don't collect anything, we'll collect maybe one individual. Um, the next thing that come to, comes to mind are with floods, especially as it relates to any animal species that's fossorial. If they are um, tied to living underneath the ground, um, they are going to be directly affected by something like a flood. Um, but yes, definitely um, extirpation, uh, local extinction of animal species is is going to be a problem that we need to deal with, especially because those individuals may play a key role in you know, their particular ecosystem. Okay, very good, very good. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. We have about a minute left. If there's anybody in the chat or on the uh, Q&A that wants to ask the question. John, I think there's one last question in the Q&A. It should be the most recently. Oh, let me get down and look. Oh, very good. Thanks, Randolyn. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can wildlife transfer pathogens to each other across species that they otherwise wouldn't carry naturally? Yes. Um, so can wildlife transfer pathogens to each other across species that they otherwise wouldn't carry naturally? Naturally. Yes. So, and, and, that, and that plays, I think, in part to um, what pathogens that species has come across in the past. And so it doesn't necessarily mean that you, it, it, it just matters what you have seen. Uh, so if a, if a wildlife species comes into a new area, let's say a migratory bird, that species um, uh, maybe transmit a certain pathogen that the species that's there has never seen before. Um, I think that that is kind of a crucial situation where that, that species has never seen it before and so it's going to not be a good scenario um but that you wildlife can transfer pathogens across species especially between closely related species that have either similar immune systems or or uh, has a similar does similar things have similar ecological niches um but yeah so so same with um kind of the rabies situation where you have certain species like bats and carnivore, um, carnivore species that do are subjected to rabies, they come into contact.